Mount Zion Church, here we are, ready to study the Word of God. We are studying the Gospel according to Luke, verse by verse. We are getting strong in the Word of God. So we're going to pray, and then we will get started. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us your Word, for preserving your Word all these many years that we would have it to read, Lord God, to, to, to learn. Father, we ask that you would fill us here with your Holy Spirit, that by your Spirit you would speak to our hearts, you would teach us as we read, as we look to your Word now. Father, we ask that you would make us strong, strengthen us for all the tasks of life as we look to your Word now. We thank you, Father, and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we are here in chapter 6, beginning at verse 46. Jesus is concluding here a long message that he preached to a crowd of people all gathered around him. So let's start right there at verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? <laughs> That's a pretty good question, right? Why do we say Lord Jesus if we are not making him our Lord? In other words, if we are not obeying him, if he is our Lord, our master, our God, our king, then we are to obey him. How easy it is to call him Lord, to call him Savior, but not obey him. Here's Jesus calling us not only to learn, but to obey. I had a friend one time tell me that he was sharing about Jesus with someone, and, and the person replied, well, I have made Jesus my Savior, I just haven't made him my Lord yet. Well, you know, you can't have one without the other. When we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior, as the one who went to the cross to save us from our sin, he calls us not some day, but immediately to make him our Lord, to make him our master, to obey our God. He gives us the strength to do what he teaches us to do. He will give us the strength. He sets nothing before us that we can't do because he also gives us the strength to do what he teaches us. When the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, he wasn't exaggerating. As difficult as this calling is that Jesus puts on our lives, we can do it. We can obey him. We can live the life that our God is calling us to live because he gives us the strength to do so. Well, look at verse 47 now. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. At verse 48, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. So here's Jesus saying, if you want to build your life well, then not only learn from me, but put into practice what you have learned. So in this long sermon, this long message that Jesus uh, had been speaking to the crowds all around them. He had said things like, forgive, and you will be forgiven. Now, if we learn that and put it into practice, then we build our life well, and when the floods, the storms of life come, we can stand strong. Jesus had said, judge not, and you will not be judged. If we put that into practice, then we can stand strong no matter what challenges and difficult times come in our lives. When Jesus said, be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful, if we put that into practice, then we can stand strong no matter what happens. When we read in Scripture, be faithful in marriage. If we put that into practice, if we obey our God, then when the challenges and the difficulties of life come, we will stand strong. When he said that gossiping is an abomination to God, if we obey him and do not gossip. When he said lying lips are an abomination to God, if we obey him and do not lie. When he said open your hand freely to the poor and needy, if we obey him and do so. Then when the storms of life come, we will stand strong. The storms of life inevitably come. The question is, do we build our lives well? We build our lives well. We build strength into our lives when we obey our God. 
when we do what he teaches us to do. We've been reading some difficult words in this message here in chapter 6 that Jesus spoke. He said, love your enemies. Well, be kind to the ungrateful. Be merciful as your father is merciful. These are hard words to put into practice. But Jesus is telling us, if you want to build a life that can stand, when the inevitable floods of life, the inevitable challenges and difficulties of life come, then obey me. Obey me. We tend to choose certain words of Scripture that we will put into practice. We tend to choose the parts that are maybe easier for us to put into practice and ignore the parts that are harder for us to put into practice. We tend to point out other people's sins and not look at our own. But here's Jesus saying, obey me. Obey me. And your life will stand strong. So at verse 49, but the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. But if we learn and learn from Jesus, if we study the word, if we listen to lots of sermons and teachings, but don't put it into practice, then we've built a house without a foundation. We've built a life that won't have any strength, a life that won't be able to stand when the hard times come. You know, we can look at all the difficulties in this world around us, and we can get our, our lives filled with fear. But here's te Jesus teaching us, yep, floods do come, but live as I command you to live, as I tell you to live, and then you need not be afraid of the inevitable floods and troubles and difficulties of life. Your house, your life will stand strong, no matter how challenging life becomes, if you obey me. You know, as we read through the scriptures, we need then always to be asking ourselves, am I obeying my God? Am I doing what he has told me to do? We need to be asking the Lord to hold a mirror up in front of us because it's so hard to, for us to see ourselves as we truly are. But the Lord will hold that mirror up in front of us if we ask him to. If we ask him to show us the, the true state of our souls, if we ask him to show us in those ways that we are not obeying him, he will do so and he will give us the strength then to turn to him and to obey him in all ways. Let's go to chapter 7 now at verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. So Jesus concludes what he, he spoke to the people, and he goes now back into the town of Capernaum. Capernaum, you remember, was along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And at verse 2, now, a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. Now, a centurion was a Roman soldier who was the commander of a hundred soldiers. So you remember that some 200 years before the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire had conquered Israel. And so for 200 years, the Israelites had lived under the oppressive hand of a foreign power. The Romans conquered nation after nation after nation, and what they did was to tax them heavily. To tax them heavily so that Rome could continue its opulent lifestyle. And so what did that require? That required that Rome have their soldiers in all these nations that they conquered to enforce the collection of taxes. Now, this centurion, this commander of a hundred soldiers, had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was valu highly valued by him. So, at verse 3, when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. So, here we learn that this centurion, this commander of 100 Roman soldiers was unlike many of the Roman soldiers and commanders because this man apparently, and as we will see more so in a moment, had been a blessing to the people of Israel, to the Jews. He had been a blessing to them. 
he had perhaps come to believe in the one God of heaven and earth, the Lord God himself, the God of Israel. Perhaps had come to believe in him or perhaps had not come to believe in the true and living God. But he asks Jesus, he asks some of the elders of the Jews, that, meant, uh, that was a phrase that meant some of the leaders of the people, the Jewish people there in Capernaum, they, uh, he asks them to go to Jesus and ask him to come and heal this servant of the centurion. So at verse 4, And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. Now, first of all, isn't it remarkable that this centurion, unlike most of the Roman soldiers and officials in the land of Israel, was looking to this God, was looking to the true and living God, had heard about this Jesus and wanted him to come. Now, was it because he had come to believe in Jesus? Was it because he had come to believe in the God of Israel? We don't know. Was it simply because he's desperate for this servant of his to be well? We don't know. But what we do know is that he asks for Jesus' help. Maybe you're in that place where you're not sure you believe yet. You're not sure you believe in the Lord. But if you will turn to him, if you will look to him, we will see that Jesus brings help to this man. If you will look to him. Now we'll see what it is about this man what it is about this man in a moment that uh, Jesus is quite amazed to see. We'll see something about this man that Jesus was quite amazed to see. But here he is uh, doing something that would have been quite a surprise to most of the people. The elders, however, say to, to Jesus, he is worthy for you to have uh, you do this for him. In other words, most of the Roman soldiers... The officers, etc., treated the Israelites, treated the Jews terribly. They weren't very worthy for Jesus to do something for them. But let's think about that. Are any of us worthy for Jesus to do what he did for us? Are any of us worthy of what Jesus did for us there on the cross? No. No, not at all. Not at all. Read the beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans. For a couple of chapters there, he makes this point. There's nothing good within us. We are all sinners through and through. We are not worthy of what Jesus did for us. When he went to that cross, he went to that cross for all of us unworthy sinners. Well, look at verse 5 now. The, the elders of Capernaum continuing to speak to Jesus. For he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. He's been very kind to us. He loves our nation. He does what's best for us. He has compassion for us. Rome did not have compassion for any of the nations that it conquered. But here was a Roman soldier who had compassion, who had kindness. And they say he built for us our synagogue. Now, believe it or not, I had the privilege to be in Capernaum. I went to Israel twice years ago, and both times had the privilege to be in Capernaum. And that first century synagogue that this Roman centurion paid for to have built, the archaeological ruins have been unearthed. You can stand on the floor of that Capernaum. You can see the walls that are still standing. The roof, of course, is fallen and gone. You can see where the people sat it's still there. This is not a fairy tale once upon a time far away. This is history. So this centurion built the synagogue for them. Now, centurions would have been much better paid than the average Roman soldier, but he still wouldn't have been wealthy enough to do this without quite a bit of sacrifice. He made the sacrifice to build this synagogue for the people of Capernaum. It was in that synagogue, you remember, where Jesus healed that man with the withered hand. So at verse 6, and Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under 
my roof. So Jesus is coming now to the home of the centurion. When he gets close to the home, the centurion sends out some friends and says to them, they have a message from the centurion saying, uh, do not trouble yourself. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, to come into my house. So this centurion is very aware that he's not living according to the commandments of God. He's very aware that uh, a Jewish rabbi would not have come into his home. He doesn't know this Jesus. But he knows that a teacher of the law of Israel would not have been uh, willing to enter the home of someone like him. So we see this centurion is not um, someone who is yet living according to the commandments of God. And yet, can't we identify with him here? Can't we identify him when we go to our Lord in prayer? Isn't that the humble prayer of our hearts? Lord, I am not worthy of what I'm asking you to do for me. But Lord, I'm coming to you because you have shown on the cross that you love unworthy sinners like me. Father, you gave your son on that cross to forgive my sin, to cleanse me of my sin. Father, I'm coming humbly asking that you would do this for me. And so at verse 7, the centurion's message now continues, the message to Jesus, Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. In other words, he's saying, this is why I myself didn't come, but asked if, if the elders of your people would come to you, uh, because I know I'm unworthy, but please, uh, you don't need to come to my home, you don't need to come under my roof, but please, Lord, help me. As you speak the word, just speak the word, and I know my servant will be healed. Wow. Wow. Just speak the word. Isn't that, isn't that an amazing faith? An amazing faith? Isn't that the faith that we're seeking? Asking the Lord to give us this kind of faith? To believe that when we ask, what did Jesus say? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and to you the door will be opened. And so this centurion says, Lord, simply say the word and let my servant be healed. The message goes on there at verse 8. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one go and he goes and to another come and he comes. And to my servant do this and he does it. The centurion's message to Jesus, I understand authority. I'm a commander of soldiers. I'm a commander of servants. They do what I'm telling them to do. He's saying I understand your authority. He says, I understand the power, the authority that you have. I speak a word, and my soldiers do what I tell them to do. My servants do what I tell them to do. Uh, Lord, you speak a word, and I know it will be done. It will be done. And you know, when we read in Scripture, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible to those who believe. I can do all things in him who strengthens me? Do we have the faith of this soldier that we only need the Lord to say the word? To say the word, and it will be done. And so this is the faith that we are striving to have in our hearts. When those uh, persons around Jesus ask that time, Lord, increase my faith. That, 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 that father in saying to Jesus, increase my faith. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. The disciples increase our, our faith. Wow. Do we, this is our prayer. Give me that kind of faith. Give me that kind of belief. And so at verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus was amazed. Here was a Roman soldier, a Roman soldier who had faith, more faith than he had seen in his fellow Israelites. 
Wow. This is what we are asking Jesus to give us, to give us faith. And what does the scripture tell us? That faith is a gift. It's not of ourselves, the apostle Paul said. And so we do ask him, as the disciples asked, increase our faith. As that, as that father asked, I believe, help my unbelief. We do ask him to increase our faith so that we pray with faith. How many times did Jesus say, uh, by your faith, you have been healed? Wow. What an amazing God we have who knows that we need faith. If we live not by sight, by what we can see, but by faith. What an amazing God we have who knows that we need faith and will give us faith, will strengthen our faith, will, faith, will increase our faith. And so at verse 10, when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Jesus spoke the word and that servant was healed. And maybe we say, but... I have faith, and yet I pray, and my prayers aren't answered. I have faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith even the size of a mustard seed, you say to a mountain, move, and it will be cast into the sea. And we say, but I, I do have faith. I know I have at least a mustard seed size faith. Well, the apostle Paul prayed that that thorn in the flesh, we think it was an eye disease, some kind of physical affliction, be removed. And the Lord did not remove that physical affliction, but did something greater for him. Did something greater for him. Gave him a strength he had never known. Wow. And so we pray with faith. We ask with faith. And then we trust. We trust that God does give to those who ask. He does open the door uh, to those who knock. Those who seek do find. Do we find something greater than what we even asked for? Does he give something greater than what we had even imagined he would give? Paul came to understand that the strength that Jesus gave him was far more important, was far greater than if he had removed that thorn in the flesh that Paul asked him to remove. So we do ask him to increase our faith. We do ask him to help our unbelief. We do ask him to have faith even the size of a mustard seed. And we ask with that faith, faith and we trust. We trust that he always does what's best. Always does what's best for us. Let's go to verse 11. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. Nain is a little village up in the hills of Galilee. It's still there. I had the privilege to go to the village of Nain. The word Nain means pleasant. It's in a pleasant location. It's still a pleasant location. Beautiful hills all around it. Nain would have been a very poor village at the time of Jesus. At verse 12, as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And so Jesus approaches the town, the front gate of the town, the entrance to this town. Nain would have been a small town, but it did have a wall, not maybe as high, certainly not as high and strong of a wall as uh, Jerusalem, a place like Jerusalem had, high walls, strong gates, but perhaps even just a, a wall to keep the wildlife out, probably wouldn't have kept much of an army out, but even to keep just the wildlife out of the town at night. Jesus drew near to the gate of the town, and there is a funeral procession. There's a man who had died was being carried out. Now, they didn't have coffins that, with lids that closed, uh, they had more like just a plank. He's, his body is on top of a plank of wood, and he's being carried out. They're heading to the, the place of burial. The, the only son of his mother, uh, he was the only son of his mother, uh, who was a widow. And there is a crowd from the town that was with her. So here's how the funeral procession would have been. This widow would have been in the front, 
typically in our funeral processions today at a, a cemetery, the casket goes first, and then the family, and then the rest of the crowd. In the funeral processions of that time, the, the closest family member was in the front, leading the procession. So this woman who is a widow now has lost her son, and she is at the front of the procession. And let us also remember that uh, they buried immediately. They buried immediately. They didn't wait. They, they didn't wait days as we might wait. They, they buried immediately. And so this woman's son has just died, and they are carrying now his body out uh, as she leads the way to the place of burial. Now, the fact that she is a widow and he was her only son means that this woman not only has now the grief of having lost her husband and now having lost her only son, but this means that she is heading for poverty. Because a woman without a husband and without a son was uh, in a, a very bad way, that she would be reduced to a life of abject. All the people were poor. She would be reduced to a life of abject poverty. At verse 13, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep, do not weep. So he saw her and had compassion on her. To, compassion, to have compassion, the word compassion literally means to hurt with. She hurt and he hurt with her. Isn't this amazing? We have a God who is compassionate, a God who hurts when he, we hurt. When he sees your pain, he's not unmoved by your pain, by our hurt, by our pain. He hurts when we hurt. He had compassion on her. He said, do not weep. Now, why did he say, do not weep? Did he say that because, he, uh, just, you know, what, what are you weeping for? Why are you crying? No, he hurt with her, and he knew what he was about to do. And so at verse 14, then he came up and touched the bier, which means the, the platform, the body's being carried on, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, the fact that he comes up and touches this platform on which the body is would have shocked, would have stunned everyone. Why? Because to touch a dead body or to touch even the platform on which this dead body is lying would have made him ritually or ceremonially unclean. At a time of death, only the closest family members would have done so, would have made themselves unclean for the sake of carrying the body, and they would have had to then follow all of the, prescri uh, you know, the prescriptions of the law to deal with their unclean but a rabbi, a teacher of the law, would never have done so. But our Lord Jesus, he knows that the death of this young man is not going to make him unclean. And so he goes up and touches the platform on which this body is lying. This is why he comes to you and me in our unworthiness, in our sinfulness, with the filth of our sin upon us. Because he knows that we are not going to make him unclean. He is going to cleanse us. The death of our souls is not going to destroy him. He already went to the cross. He already took all of our uncleanness. He took all of our filth. He took all of our sin upon himself there on that cross. The one who was without sin went to the cross taking all of the sin of the world. And the Apostle Paul tells us he who, was, who, he who was without sin became sin on that cross. Our Lord comes to our lives. He touches our hearts. He cleanses our hearts because he already went to that cross, taking all of our sin and ascending into hell because of it all and with it all for our sake. Do you know that you are very unclean? Do you know that there is sin in your life of which you are ashamed? 
do you know there is an uncleanness of your soul? Understand this. Jesus already paid the price for it. He already took it all to hell. He comes to you now. He draws near to you. He calls your name. He's knocking at the door of your heart. He is seeking to cleanse your life. He is seeking to remove that sin from your life. Listening to this, me speaking, you listening, we are not physically dead there lying on a platform, but were we not dead in our sin? And Jesus came to make us alive? Is there someone listening right now? You've not yet turned to Jesus. You've not yet put your faith in him. You are dead in your sins. You're completely cut off from God. He died to make you alive, to bring you from death to life. He died to cleanse us of all our sins. He died to give us that holiness, the scripture says, without which no one will see the Lord. Wow. And so he said to the young man, I say to you, young man, arise, arise. Isn't that what he's saying to you and me right now? From whatever has us in its grip, whatever that is not of him that has gotten hold of our hearts, is he not saying to you and me, get up now and walk out of this? Walk out of this death? Walk out of that which has you in bondage? Arise. Is it anger that's gotten hold of you? Is it pridefulness that has gotten hold of you? Here's Jesus saying, arise now. Walk from that pridefulness. Walk away from that anger. Young man, I say to you, arise. And so at verse 15, and the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Jesus gave him to his mother. Woo! Wow. That young man got up. Jesus ro- raised him up from death itself. Oh, yes. When you close your eyes, when you and me, when we close our eyes in death, he will raise us up from death to life. We will open our eyes, and there he is. We will look into his eyes of perfect love. That day is coming. That day is coming. You need have no fear of death when you've put your faith in Jesus, when you've humbled yourself before him. We need have no fear of death because we close our eyes. Next thing we know, we're opening our eyes and there is Jesus. Next thing we know, we're turning around and there are all of our loved ones who have looked to him. All the children of God. We need have no fear of death whatsoever. He sets us free. That's what the scripture says. He sets us free from the fear of death. He sets us free from the fear of death. So Jesus gave him to his mother. Woo, what a moment. Wow. You know, I was preaching right here in the tent a couple months ago, and I was thinking about this, speaking about this, and out of uh, my mouth came some words that I had never thought before. As most of you know, uh, my youngest daughter, Hannah, died almost seven years ago now, and I was, I was preaching. Out of, that, um, out of my mouth came these words that the day my daughter died, God didn't take her away from me. He gave her to me. Why do I say that? Because Hannah's life, there was so much distress, so much trouble, so much difficulty in her life, and we never knew exactly what was happening at any given time, and it was all just, it was just so, so hard. Hannah struggled terribly in addiction. And the night she died, what did I know? What did I know that moment? What have I known every moment since? I know where she is. I know that she's well. I know that she's not struggling. I know that he has wiped away every tear from her eyes. He didn't take her away from me. He gave her again to me. Whew. That's the promise of our Lord. That's the promise of our Lord. Is he saying to you now? Is he saying to you now, get up, arise? then get up. Get up. Walk out of that sin that has had hold of you. Put your faith in him. Trust in him. Trust in him. You can get up. 
You can walk out of that sin. Trust in him. He'll give you back to the people who love you. Are you listening to me right now and there's a loved one that, you, that has died and you feel like God took them away from you? No. No, he didn't take them away from you. He didn't take that loved one away. That loved one. Wow. That loved one with Jesus? That loved one with Jesus? And you say, well, I don't know if my loved one's with Jesus. I don't know if my loved one had faith in Jesus. Listen, what did Jesus say to that thief on the cross? That thief who was dying. That thief who had been screaming at him like the other thief on the other side of Jesus. What did, that thief who then said, Lord, Lord, Lord. What did he say? This day he will be with me in paradise. You trust in Jesus. You trust in Jesus. And so at verse 16, fear seized them all and they glorified God saying a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. Yeah, a great, great fear sees them all. They're, they're stunned. They're amazed. They knew this man was dead. And, and this, this Jesus, this, this Jesus who's from Nazareth, Nain is not far away from Nazareth. He just raised him up. They are amazed. They glorified God. This report just goes among all the people. At verse 17, and this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding, all the surrounding country. Wow. Wow. Look at verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, so this is John the Baptist now, John the Baptizer, who you remember is in jail. King Herod had jailed John. So the disciples of John report this to, to John. Certainly report to him that Jesus stopped and touched a platform of a man who had died and said to that man, arise, and that man got up. Certainly reported that to John. But I wonder if they also reported to John that Jesus touched the platform of a dead man. He touched the platform, the burial, the funeral platform of a dead man. I wonder if they also reported that to John. The people were stunned that that man got up, of course. But they also would have been stunned to see Jesus. We can't even hardly imagine that. They would have been stunned. They would have been shocked. They would have been like, whoa, why is he doing that? So I wonder if they also reported that to John. So at verse 19, and so John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, this is the same John, of course, who had baptized Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knew who this Jesus was. He had known who this Jesus was. But now he apparently has a question. Are you the one to come? Or shall we look for another? That's why I say, I think maybe they also reported that he touched that beer, that platform of that, in that funeral procession. Because now John seems to have a question. He had known when he had seen Jesus that day when he had seen Jesus that day that he baptized him, he had known, he had known who Jesus was. So at verse 20, and when the men had come to him, so these two followers of John the Baptist now come to Jesus, and when they had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So they bring John's message to Jesus. And at verse 21, in that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind he bestowed sight. Jesus was praying and praying and praying with person after person after person after person. 
And these followers of John the Baptist saw that. They had found where Jesus was. There was huge crowds around him. They saw the blind now seen. They saw persons who had been tr plagued, you know, troubled by evil spirits set free. They'd seen persons healed of diseases and, and plagues. They saw that with their eyes. So at verse 22, he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Go and tell John what you've seen, what you've heard. You've seen these miracles. You've, you've seen it. You've seen it with your own eyes. You've seen the lame walk. You've seen the, the, the deaf here. You've, you've seen the dead raised up. You've seen, isn't that interesting, at the end of that list of miracles, he says, the poor have good news preached to them. The poor have good news preached to them. Now, what is what is Jesus doing here? Well, first of all, he's alluding to uh, the prophet Isaiah who said that the one anointed by the Father, the one who would be sent as the anointed one, the Messiah, would do these things. But it isn't it interesting, the end of that list, after all those miracles, the poor have good news preached to them. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? I think it's interesting for us to think about, to think about, the poor have good news preached to them. Are we blessing the poor? Are we praying for, giving to, loving, and preaching, the sharing the good news, preaching the good news to those who are poor? Are we or aren't we? That's the work of Jesus, to pray for those miracles that, uh, that Jesus lists, Yes, and to preach good news to the poor, to bless the poor, to open our hands freely to the poor and to the needy. At verse 23, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. <laughs> and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Uh, so he, John, Jesus is saying to these messengers, go back and tell John these things. You've seen exactly what the prophet Isaiah said would happen by the anointed one, what the anointed one, the Messiah, would do. And by the way, tell John that he'll be blessed if he's not offended. If he's not offended by me. If he's not offended by the fact that I, that I touched that funeral beer, that unclean platform that that body lay on. Do we get offended by Jesus? I think we maybe get a little more offended by Jesus than we sometimes realize. I think those scriptures that we kind of skip over maybe offend us a little more than we realize. Again, we tend to focus on the scriptures that apply more to others than to us, or in other words, the scriptures that seem to point out the sins that are in other people's lives rather than the scriptures that point out our own sins. And so perhaps Jesus offends us a little more than we realize. We will be blessed. It will be well with us if we're willing to hear all that God would say to us. If we're willing to listen carefully to what God has to say to us. So at verse 24, when John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out in the will, into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? So the messengers leave. So we can picture now that the, when these messengers were talking to Jesus, the crowds are all around them. They're close in. People are hearing the conversation. And so he starts to talk to the, the people that are around him. Now, when you went out into the wilderness, you remember John was out in the wilderness. What did you... Um, what did you go to see? When he says, uh, uh, did you go to see a reed shaken by the wind? In other words, the man that you went out to see, was it a, a man who was kind of like a, just a lonely reed that was out there in the middle of the dry desert that was up, and when the wind blew, it shook? In other words, did you go out to see someone who didn't have much earthly strength, much earthly wealth, much earthly prosperity, good circumstance in his life? Is that what you went to see? And so at verse 25, it implies, no, 
No, that's not what you went to see at verse 25. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. Did you go out to see a man who looked like he lived in a king's court? A man with prosperity and splendid clothing and living in luxury? Is that, is that what you went out to see? No? No, not that? At verse 26, what then did you go out to see? A prophet? Oh, did you go out to see a man who spoke the words of God? A man who was speaking the words of God? A prophet? By the way, let me put a little parenthesis here. In our modern secular language, a prophet, uh, people in our secular culture use that word, a prophet, to, to speak about someone who just always talks about the future. This is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and that's going to happen. The scriptural use of the word prophet is someone who speaks the words of God. Someone who speaks the words of God. And so here's Jesus saying to them, did you out, go out to see someone who was speaking the word of God? Is that what you went to see? So Jesus goes on there at verse 26. He says, yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He's saying that's who this John that you went out to see. Remember, huge crowds were going out to see him. He's saying, hey, yo, when you went and heard him, he was speaking to you the word of God. Are you doing what he said? Are you obeying the Lord who put his words in John's mouth? Are you doing it or not? Are you doing it or not? At verse 27, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. He said, this, this John, he said, Pay attention to what you heard him say. Live according to what he heard, you heard him say. Because, in fact, the Father sent him to prepare the way What's Jesus saying? For me. To prepare you for hearing what I have to say. To prepare you for receiving the one that the Father has sent now, me. That's what Jesus is saying to them. And that's how John understood himself. John understood himself to be one who was preparing the way for the Messiah. John had understood that when he had seen Jesus... This is the one that I came to prepare the way for. John had understood that, but then John now had second thoughts. Maybe he's not the right one. Now, so Jesus sends that message back to John, and now he says to the crowd, and I want you to pay attention to what you heard him say. What you heard him say. At verse 28, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. It says there's been nobody born on the face of this earth who was greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What does that mean? Wait a minute. No one born, uh, there's no one uh, born uh, of a physical birth, one born of, of women, no one on this earth who's had a physical birth who was greater than John. He says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Do you remember when Jesus told Nicodemus about the spiritual birth that happens in our lives? About a new birth, a birth of the Spirit? When we put our faith in Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus, we humble ourselves, we turn away from our sin, we cry out to him for mercy, we ask him to forgive our sin. We put our trust in him because we see that he paid the price of our sin on the cross. We ask him to, to, to pray to the Father to send the Holy Spirit to us. And when the Holy Spirit comes, when the Father sends the Holy Spirit to our lives, the Holy Spirit comes and revives our own spirit that has died within us. That's why the Apostle Paul said, you're dead in your sin. You're dead. We're dead in our sin. But we put our faith in Jesus. Jesus prays to the Father. The Father sends the Holy Spirit. The Spirit revives revives the spirit within us. And so we come from death to life. And so those now who are even the least in the kingdom of God have had this new birth. 
And so here's Jesus now saying, when the Father, you put your faith in, in me, and when, the, when the, the Father sends the Holy Spirit and you have now new life, you'll see even more than John the Baptist is seeing. At that moment, John the Baptist hadn't seen yet, right? Because now he had questions. Here's Jesus saying, you put your faith in me for forgiveness, for the, for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit now to come and give you new life, and you'll see even more. You'll see even more than John has thus far seen. Wow, what an incredible promise. What an incredible promise that, that Jesus make, made to the crowds that day and makes to you and me. He makes this amazing promise that the, the old me will be dead and gone. That a new me now, a new me will come to life. A, a new birth, a new life he gives me. He doesn't just, Jesus doesn't just improve our life a little bit. He gives us a new, a new life in him. You know, the old you will keep doing what you've always done. If I see myself living in, in ways that I know are not of God, the old me, if I just stay the old me, I'll just keep doing those same things over and over again. They're what's working for me, even though they're not working very well. Here's Jesus saying, I'll make you into a new you. I won't just improve you a little bit. I won't just give you a self-improvement course. I'll pray to the Father. The Father will send the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit will give you now strength you've never had, wisdom you've never had. By the presence of the Holy Spirit reviving you, giving you new life you will become a new you. At verse 29, when all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. So when the, the people who were, were poor heard this, when the tax collectors who were despised heard this, when it says they declared God just, they meant righteous. They praised God. They praised God. Because what? They had received the baptism that John had baptized them with. In other words, they had received his message. What did John say? I baptize you with water for repentance, for a turning. Repentance means turning. I baptized you. You heard my message. And I baptized you then with water because you were repenting. You were turning away from sin to the Lord. So those who were despised and those who were struggling, they had been baptized with the baptism of John. They had repented of their sin. At verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. But those who consider themselves big shots, those who consider themselves more holy and more wise than others, the Pharisees and the lawyers, this meant like religious lawyers, experts in the law of God, they didn't hear, they didn't receive that message and then baptism of repentance that John called them to. And so what? They rejected the purpose of God for themselves. They rejected, I don't want to reject the purpose of God for my life. I don't want to reject God's purpose for my life. And so when God speaks of that which is sin, when God calls me to repentance, when God calls me to turn away from some sin in my life, if I am wise, I will heed that call to repentance. I will heed that call to turn, to turn away from my sin, to turn to the ways of God. Now, at verse 31... To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? He's saying, now why? He said, Let me. He's, he's actually getting back to where he had started there, talking to the crowd. What did you go in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Somebody living in luxury? A, a prophet? What were you looking for when you went out to, to listen to John? He says, what is this? What, what are y'all like, this generation? So at verse 32, they are like children sitting in the marketplace, and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. He said, let me tell you what people are like. And here he's referring to a game that children would play. They played the game of weddings and funerals. So children would all get together and act out a wedding. Or children would all get together and act out a funeral. But 
the, the, here he said, look, some of the children are saying to other children, look, we wanted to play weddings. You didn't want to do that. We wanted to play funerals. You didn't want to do that. Here's Jesus saying to the crowd, so those of you who are rejecting me, those of you who rejected John, what is it that you want? At verse 33, for John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. So John, you remember, came in the wilderness, lived an ascetic life. In other words, he, 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 he didn't uh, come up into the towns and sit down and, and join people in feasts and uh, celebrations. He lived in the wilderness. When he preached, he was down in the wilderness. He had nothing, nothing, nothing. And you said, he has a demon. He's living like that because he has a demon. At verse 34, Jesus goes on. The son of man, he means himself, has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He's saying, what do you want? You said John had a demon because he lived down in the wilderness and all he ate was bread and, 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 and you, you criticized him, you criticized him. I come celebrating with people. I come sitting down with sinners, gluttons, uh, uh, tax collectors, sinners, and you call me a glutton and a drunkard. Let's put a big parenthesis here. Jesus never got drunk because Jesus never sinned. And the scripture says that it's a sin to drink, to get drunk, to drink and to drunkenness. So Jesus never got drunk, but they just looked at him, you know, at feasts with people, and they accused him of that. John wasn't filled with a demon, but they accused him of that. And here's Jesus saying to those of the crowd who had rejected John and were now rejecting him, you just don't want to hear God's word. You'll come up with whatever reason you can to not hear what God is saying to you. Do we come up with reasons not to hear what God is saying to us. Do we come up with reasons why we skip over quickly, we read quickly by some portions of Scripture and focus on other portions of Scripture? At verse 35, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Wisdom is justified by all her children. In other words, if we are children of wisdom, if we listen to, if we wisely listen to God speaking to us, if we wisely submit ourselves to the word of God, if those Pharisees and lawyers had been wise, they would have listened to John. If they had been wise, they would have listened to Jesus. John and Jesus, they conducted their ministries in two very different ways. But if the Pharisees and the lawyers had been wise, they would have listened when God was speaking to them through John, when God was speaking to them through Jesus. If they had been wise, they would have listened. If we are wise, we will listen when God speaks to our hearts. Well, we have just read a lot. There is an awful lot in there, isn't there? God's spoken an awful lot just in these passages that we have read now. Go back through these passages. Read them slowly. Ask the Lord to speak to your heart. Let's pray together. Father, we do ask. We do ask, Lord God, that you would help us to hear. Help us to hear your word. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Father, that you give us new life that you went to that cross for us all, that you, you have prayed and the Father has sent the Holy Spirit to us. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that you have so loved us. You gave us Jesus. You have so loved us that you give us new life. Lord God, we pray. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us the wisdom then, the wisdom to receive your word. To, to build our lives well in learning your word and obeying your word so that when the storms of life come, we will stand. We will stand. Lord God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. Hey, tell some people about these Bible studies.
Tell some folks about them. The Word of God is so powerful. Share the Word of God with others. Go to our website, mzpraise, P-R-A-Y-S dot org. We have a, a number of prayer nights coming up. We're worshiping again in person now and online. Join us. We are a family, a team, getting strong in the Word of God, putting our faith in Jesus into action. God bless you, Mount Zion. See you soon.